This is the uh, Corcos A. Uh, welcome. It's very nice to see your faces. I hope you're not too hungover or tired or whatever. Um, I am Alan. Uh, this is Michael. And there's Stephen in the back there. And we're going to talk to you about how IPFS deals with files. Part one of five. <coughs> it's all right. They're exciting, I think. Well, that's been the feedback so far. <laughs> <laughs> all right, first up, OK. Uh, can anyone tell me what the meaning of the word immutable is? Can't change. Yeah. All right, awesome. Unable to be changed as opposed to mutable, which is liable to be changed. Uh, so we're going to talk about why IPFS has a big focus on immutability and immutable data. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, the one on the right, <laughs> uh, there's no central point of authority, no one to implicitly trust. Uh, but in the web of today, we, uh, we implicitly trust kind of things like institutions, so certificate authorities, social media, government. Um, but that trust is easily subverted, uh, and we can't necessarily rely on the data we receive to be the data we ask for, even though we often do. Resource integrity checking is one way to ensure that data you ask for is the data you've got. Uh, the idea is to calculate an identifier for the data from the data itself. The identifier is called a hash, uh, and we use cryptography when computing the hash to ensure certain properties uh, like uniqueness and determinism, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next section. So once we've got this hash, uh, the, we can share it with the rest, rest of the world, these two people being the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> And when someone gets hold of that data, they also calculate the hash. Uh, and then they check that they match. Uh, and if they do, then yes, you've got what the data you asked for, winning. If someone else gets hold of the data uh, and the hashes don't match, then uh-oh, someone's tampered with your data. So the guarantee of integrity checking, integrity checking is that content is immutable. If the data changes, the hash I generate no longer matches. So verifiability is one of the main reasons for using immutable data. In the web of today, I can put my poodle picture up at abc.com slash poodle.jpg, uh, and 24 hours later, I can doodle on my poodle. <laughs> so let's say I add some glasses, make him look a little bit more sophisticated. Um, so the, the problem is that the content isn't inherently tied to the address. The content can change, but the URL doesn't. So depending on when I access this poodle, it could be completely different. So what we have on the web today is location addressing. It tells us where the data is stored, uh, but not much else. Content addressing, on the other hand, is where we use a hash to access the content um, and it allows us to verify the content we receive is the content that we asked for. Okay, caching and deduping. Immutable content completely solves the caching problem. Like, the, since the data is never going to change, the cache rules are cache this forever. Um, uh, so, back to our example, if we were using content addressing, uh, our cute poodle has a specific address derived from its content. Uh, the hash, um, and if I change that, uh, that poodle 24 hours later, the address also changes. Uh, but that's okay, it could be verified, cached, and fetched by anyone. What if I wanted to keep both files? Well, uh, because the content is immutable, IPFS only really, really needs to store the changes, uh, the differences. The two files that we see actually share many of the same bytes, so if I have one of those files, the amount of data I have to transfer to fetch the other is really minimal. But currently, if I want to store those two very similar pictures, I need to store both of them in full on my disk. And if I want to share them with someone, and, they want both, and the, the, I want them to see both of those pictures, then I have to transfer them both in full. Um, and we'll see more about how IPFS um, does that magic deduping stuff later. OK, fetch from anyone uh, if the content is immutable. Uh, and I can verify its integrity, I should just be able to get it from anyone. Um, and this suits P2P really, really well. But that's not true of the web today. Uh, so I have two sites on the, on the net hosting the same content. How do I know which of these poodles is the correct 
poodle? Well, okay, so the answer is that we can't trust that any of these poodles are correct. They are both adorable poodles, uh, but uh, we just can't get it from anyone. It needs to come from a trust, trusted source um, because I can't verify its integrity. All right. Uh, so we use content addressing in uh, IPFS, and we use a special hash called a CID. CID stands for Content Identifier, uh, and we're going to take a closer look now in part two of five. <laughs> okay, uh, it all starts with cryptographic hash. Um, a cryptographic hash function maps input of arbitrary size to output of a fixed size, um, and we want a few properties from that hash, the same data should always produce the same hash, so it's deterministic. Uh, it should be impossible to invert, um, we, as in we shouldn't be able to reconstruct the data from the hash. It should also be unique, uh, so no two different files should produce the same hash. There are many different hashing algorithms that exist. Uh, IPFS uses SHA-2256 by default, and uh, that is just some of, the, some of them that are available in IPFS that we could use. Older algorithms like SHA-1 are broken. They're proven to not be collision free. Uh, and, if, and the problem is that if algorithms can break, we're going to want to switch that hash that we use by default in the future. The problem with switching algorithms is that given a hash, which is just a series of, of bits, what algorithm did we use to generate that hash? We need a future-proof way of, uh, of identifying the hash function used to generate a hash, as well as the hash length. Say hello to multi-hash. It'll solve all your problems. Uh, so multi-hash is, uh, is the hash, which is just at the end there, but it's also a prefix. And that prefix is one number, algo, algorithm, um, and which identifies the hash algorithm that was used to generate the hash, and another number, uh, which is the hash length. These two numbers are both varints, and varint is just a compact encoding for integers. The algo number is a multicodec because A, it's a varint, but B, it's, uh, it's, uh, its value is a predefined value that we agree on it's in, the, in a table on the internet. The multicodec identifier for SHA-2256 is the number 18, and our hash length is 256. In binary, it looks like this. Uh, you'll see that the hash length is actually two bytes long, um, and that's because the length is over 127, and in varint encoding, uh, numbers above 127 uh, are encoded as two bytes. So you can kind of think of this as like two times 128 is 256, but that's not really how varint works. <laughs> uh, that's just a, com a coincidence, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Two bytes because it's over 127. We want to support multiple encoding <coughs> of data. So you've got a hash that, um, that addresses your data. When you get the data back, um, how do you know how it's encoded? Like we might, it might be encoded in CBOR, uh, concise binary object representation. It might be encoded in protocol buffers. It might be encoded as just plain old JSON. Um, why do we want this? Well, it might be a particularly compact binary encoding, so really efficient for storage, um, but it might be for convenience, might be just easy, it might be really quick. Um, but we have this same problem again. Like when we're looking at some encoded data, how do we know how to decode it? <coughs> same solution, <laughs> more metadata prefix. Uh, so this is an IPLD codec, uh, and IPFS at the moment, any, any um, any content that you add gets, uh, uh, is we, the codec we use to encode the data is DAG, I, uh, DAG PB. Um, and it is, uh, PB stands for protocol buffers, so it's just um, protocol buffers uh, encoded. Um, yeah, and it's, like I said, it's a compact encoding for the data. And we've had some uh, metadata to the start of the, the hash. Are there other codecs currently? Yeah, there are many IPLD formats okay. that you can use. Um, there are too many CID <laughs> <laughs> formats. <laughs> All right, uh, so there are two different CID versions, so um, that's mildly frustrating, but uh, so 
often nowadays, or hopefully going into the future, you will see version 1 as the main version that we're using. Uh, there is version 0 and version 1. It's just another prefix um, that we add on to the front. So all of you, if you've ever used IPFS before, you might be used to seeing CIDs like this. Uh, version 0 is a, this top one, and the version 1 one is the bottom one. Um, uh, and the ver so the version 0 ones begin with kind of QM usually. Version, uh, hang on, version 0 begins with QM. Version 1 begins with BAFI or BAFK sometimes. Um, all right, so um, the thing is, CIDs are binary data. Um, zeros and ones make for really long strings when they're printed out. Like it doesn't even fit on the, sli on the slide. So what we do is uh, we use a higher number base encoding um, to make them shorter and easier to like, print out and recognize even uh, in, when in string form. We have another problem again. <laughs> How do we interpret the, the ba number base encoding that this string was crea created with? Um, characters in one encoding are valid in another encoding. So we can't just look at the string and be like, that's, that's a base 32, or that's a base 16, <coughs> or whatever. Um, so how do, we, how do we fix that? Well, you guessed it, more meta prefix. This is multibase, and multibase helps us know the number base the content is encoded with. The first symbol is the identifier for the encoding. B uh, is base 32. Uh, Z or Z is base 58 BTC uh, and M is base 64. Version 0 CIDs like the QM1 you saw in the last slide are also base 58 encoded and I just told you that base 58 should be prefixed with Z uh, but they're not. If you're wondering about that then don't worry we will talk about it in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so the rest of the string after the first, um, first symbol is the rest of the CID uh, encoded in that particular base. So altogether for a CID, this is what it looks like. In binary form, it's the CID version, it's the IPLD format multicodec, and it's the multi-hash. And the multi-hash is split up, in, as you know, because we discovered it, into the hashing function used, the hash length, and the hash. As, as a string, we have the, um, the multi-base encoding, and that encoding applied to the rest of the CID. Cool. All right, so you can try this as well. Uh, if you fire up your browser and um, go to cid.ipfs.io, and if you have a CID ha happen, or happen to have one lying around, then you can paste it in to that tool, and it will pick out these properties that we've just been ta uh, talking about of the CID and show you them. There's a tool in IPFS if you've got it installed on the command line called IPFS CID uh, and that will allow you to change the number base or the version number of a CID. Uh, if you type IPFS CID dash dash help it will tell you how to use it. Um, so if you want to if you've got like a V0 CID and want to convert it to V1 and put that in or, or whatever. But anyway, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna open this up now and show you a few pre-prepared, some uh, CIDs I prepared earlier. <laughs> if I can figure out how to open it up, it won't connect. Of course, I need to have my daemon running. All right, so this first CID I have, get back to the start of the string. This is a Baffy CID. This is a base 32 encoded CID. Uh, ver oh, hang on. hang on, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Version one CID, it's encoded with the um, IPLD format called DAG PB. Uh, we've got the multi-hash at the end, which is uh, sharp, the name of the multi-hash, the uh, name of the hashing algorithm is SHA-2256, the length is 256, and that is the, um, the actual hash. Uh, so multibase, as, as I was saying, is it, uh, its code is B. Start of the string is B, so that's good. That matches up, base 32, DAG PB. Uh, for the multi-hash, the, co like the code for SHA-2256 is 18, as you saw on the slides. Uh, so yeah, that's... That's one. I've got a base64 encoded CID <coughs> here. If I paste that in, <coughs> so remember I said that base64 CIDs start with M, and they do. 
according to this, it's all good. So this is another CID V1, uh, and yeah, base 64. I've also got one here with a different IPLD format. Oh, whoops, sorry. So this is a V1 CID encoded with base 58 BTC, uh, and uh, this is interesting because it's using a DAG CBOR IPLD format, not the DAG PB, which is the DAG PB is the default for adding files in IPFS, but you can use the IPFS DAG API to, uh, to create structures that have different encodings, and this one's good for uh, uh, like JSON data. <coughs> Okay, and so finally, the one you've probably all been waiting for, what is going on here? All right, QM. This is a V0 CID, as you can see here. QM. Begins with QM. Uh, it's encoded as base 58, but what have we got here? Multi-base code implicit? Multi-codec code implicit? What? Should we, should we talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, cool. That's good, because I've got slides prepared for it. <laughs> All right. In the beginning, there was only multi-hash, <laughs> and they were encoded as base58 BTC. All version 0 CIDs have no multi-base. And so that's why they don't start with Z. Why do they start with QM, though? Well. They are just multi-hashes, uh, and, mu and they're just multi-hashes encoded with base 58. So uh, if you remember uh, back to the slides about multi-hashes, multi-hashes are the hashing function plus the hash length plus the hash. And those two things at the start of the, um, of the multi-hash are, are kind of fixed, usually, in IPFS, so which is why you see a lot of these. And, and the, it's just the, what it is, these Q, this QM is just those two numbers encoded in base 58. The multi-base is always base 58 BTC, like I said. Um, and so what else do these not have? If, uh, if version 0 CIDs are just multi-hashes, what do they not have other than not having a multi-base? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Right. They don't have a format. They don't have a CID version. So altogether for V zeros, this is way simpler. It's just they're just multi hashes, uh, and in string form they're base fifty eight encoded multi hashes, which is why they start with QM. Um, you can kind of think of them like this. So the multi base is always base fifty eight BTC. Uh, BTC is Z. It's implicit, it's not written. CID version is always zero. It's implicit, it's not written. The IPLD format is always DAGPB. It's implicit, it's not written. The hash function is always SHA-2256. It's, it's explicit, not implicit. It was a trick question. It's in the multi-hash. <laughs> uh, so the hash function is in the multi-hash, it is in it is, it is there. Uh, the, the hash length is also explicit. It's in the multi-hash. Uh, and if any of those variables change, then you don't have a V0 CID anymore. All right, cool. So now you know how IPFS addresses content um, using CIDs uh, and hashes. And we can, we can now learn about the data structures that IPFS actually addresses. So cool. I'll hand over to Michael. Yo. Hey, everybody. All right. Now that we've done this three other times, this should go really, really well. Uh, so, what's a DAG? Uh, I'm sure that you've probably heard at this point people throw this term around a little bit. Um, DAG is just a, a fancy acronym for directed acrylic graph, which is a very fancy word for a really simple concept. Um, if you think about a normal tree structure, you have a root and then some branches and then eventually some leaves. And typically in a tree structure, a leaf would have one parent. Um, in a DAG, it's a tree, but a leaf could have multiple parents. Um, you can't have circular references. We'll get into that in a minute. And, uh, that's impossible, but um, that's all that it means. It's unnecessary uh, <coughs> gobbledygook. Uh, <laughs> so let's build a DAG. Um, so one interesting thing about building 
uh, hash-based data structures is that you have to build them backwards. Um, so get used to writing recursive functions. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that. Um, so we're going to start here with hello world, just our little object, which is the leaf node. Um, we're going to get a hash of that. The hash is qm hash one. Now we build the first branch to that leaf node. Um, that's going to, you know, be an object with a property of foo that points at this leaf node. That's going to get qm hash two. And then we can create another leaf node, all pointing back into a parent. Um, so this one has a bar property that points to the same leaf node, and another property that's just some arbitrary node data. Um, and both of those are referred to in the root, so they both get hashed and then use as properties in the root node. So what you end up with is a full data structure that looks something like this, right? Um, now, in, in this one, you can't tell that these are basically pointed the same thing, but semantically, this is a big data structure that you get. And then you can break that into blocks like this. Now, obviously, this is a very tiny data structure, so we wouldn't normally break this into a bunch of blocks, but when you have really arbitrarily large data structures and you want to break them into smaller semantic blocks, this is how you do it. You do it with linking. Um, and the way that links uh, end up working in any API, in IPLD, or in IPFS, is that they get, they get uh, traversed basically transparently. So you know, if you take the, the hash of QM4, which, which is our root node here, um, and you follow it through you know, one foo hello, you traverse through the entire structure until you hit this, this hello thing, right? And it's just going to grab all of those blocks for you and traverse it um, transparently. Um, but you could also you know, grab the, the hash of one of the leak nodes here, like QM hash three, and look at a property there. Um, you could grab the hash of the leak node itself and look at a property, right? So, um, you know, if you already have the hash of, of any of these uh, branches, you can traverse it even more efficiently. Um, here we go. So, if we look at the tree now, sort of in a top-down way where the links are sort of pointing down, um, we can talk about some of the, the nice constraints of, of making DAGs. So, we see here that we have um, two branches pointing to the same leaf, but what happens if we try to create a reference back to the parent. We basically try to create a circular reference. Well, it's actually impossible <laughs> because if you modify this, you're going to modify the hash. And because the hash of this is part of what is like inside of these leaves that are included in the root hash, then that would change the hash of everything all the way up. So this, this knowledge, what the hash would be of the root node, is just impossible to know up front, um, unless you have a, a hash function that's been broken. So if you don't use shell one. Um, <laughs> bad things can happen. Uh, so any questions before we get into sort of block sizes and a discussion about, about that a little bit? No questions? Cool. OK, block sizes. So uh, yeah, block sizes are, are like the, the three bears. You know, you like uh, <laughs> too hot, too cold, just right. Uh, so blocks can be too big. Um, and there's some, when you start to make blocks bigger and bigger, you get a set of different problems. One big one is that you can't download a single block from multiple peers. Um, the problem is that uh, in, in an untrusted network, anybody could just give you bad data. The only way that you have to validate if the data was right or not is the hash of the entire block. So if you pull data from two people for the same block, and then it doesn't validate, who sent you bad data? You have no idea. <laughs> Um, so like BitTorrent has been dealing with this for like longer than anybody and they just don't try to do that <laughs> anymore. If a, if a peer is too slow and they decide to take it from a new peer, they'll just download all the same data again. Um, you, so when, when you have these uh, large immutable structures and then you mutate them, you, you get a new root, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. Um, you end up creating what are called orphan blocks. Um, if you've ever built databases or dealt with any like on disk um, mutable data structures, you, you deal with the same problem, where like as you change things, you end up with data that's just like garbage that then has to get collected um, at some point in time. So when you have really big blocks, that leaves you with really big orphan blocks, and then those really big orphan blocks create like a bigger GC problem. Um, different transports may have different limitations. BitSwap has issues with blocks over two megabytes right now. That will probably be fixed, but like, you should still try to keep that in mind and keep in mind that other transports are gonna have similar issues. Um, you also end up with a lot less deduplication the bigger that you make the blocks. Um, that's because the, the only method that we have for deduplication is the hash itself. So um, if you take all these, these little particles that would be the same data across many different nodes, but they're not links, they're just embedded in the blocks, then those won't ever get deduplicated. Um, too small. 
so you, you also end up with issues when you make a bunch of tiny, tiny, tiny blocks. So um, you, the big one is that you just end up with more requests for more blocks. If you want to get like a small amount of data, you end up getting like a lot of different blocks. Um, that could be out of the network, that could be off of disk, but it's always going to incur some kind of round trip, usually to I.O., unless you have like a lot of in-memory cache data. Um, you also end up with uh, more encoding time. Uh, when you write different block encoders, you can make them more efficient the more data that you have to encode at a time, usually. Um, so if you, if you have a much smaller sets of data, then you may end up with less efficient encoding times. The big one, though, is hashing. It, hashes, hashing functions have, uh, usually have guarantees about how long they're going to take for any amount of data. So if you end up with a lot of smaller blocks, you're going to end up with like many more hashes, which is actually going to spend like a lot more compute time on all that hashing. Um, and then, so similar to the block request, you end up with just more hops to a given piece of data. So whenever you want to look at something through a deep graph, you end up like going from one thing to the next. Um, and the more that you that you create, the more links in that chain that you create, the more perform potential performance impact you have. So what's just right? It, just right, like very much depends on your use case. There just isn't one true way to do this, unfortunately. Um, this is why we've created so many flexible structures and how you create blocks and how you create your DAGs, is that different use cases are going to call for very different DAG structures. So if you want to optimize for reads versus writes, if you can take a lot of uh, performance cost up front at write time to make the reads really fast, you might do that. Um, if, you, if you have a, so often when you have mutable structures, you will not actually mutate a particular um, part of the graph, but you might just recreate it every time. Um, a good example of this is like when IPFS creates a file and chunks it up. Um, we always pull that whole file out of disk and then run it through the chunker. We don't like look at the existing chunked file and go like, oh, I see like a particle that I can just stick in here, <laughs> right? Like, we, you know, in order to figure out if they match, we just re-encode it every time. And so you would use a very different algorithm to create that DAG and, 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 ba and balance it essentially. Um, than you would if you were just trying to mutate a DAG over time, right? Um, HAMP is like a really good example of like something that you mutate in place really often, and so there is a, there's an algorithm in the HAMP that guarantees a certain um, balance and a, and, a, and a fixed width, or sorry, a fixed depth of how big that tree will get. Um, so these are just like, you know, different trade-offs that you can make when you're deciding how to create the, the DAG and how much, and how big you want to create the block. You also have transport performance issues, right? Um, if you're pulling all of your blocks, uh, you know, out of like an HTTP2 connection to one host, it's going to have a very different performance profile than pulling them out of a peer pair network. And so you might be able to make completely different trade-offs um, when, you're, when you're creating those block structures than you would otherwise. Um, so that's, oh wait, any questions before we break, actually? Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> In the back. So, um, Basically, right now for arbitrary data, there's no optimization to try and figure out if there's overlap. Like if you're just mutating a little bit of a file, mm -hmm. that most of the, the blocks will be the same out of what you chunk, right? But uh, if you change something that's arbitrary, how do you figure out what that arbitrary bit is? Can we leave the rest? You know? Yeah. So it turns out that that particular problem in the file case is dependent on the file type. Um, and there are different chunkers that you use to potentially get better deduplication out of different file types. And so we will actually get into that a little bit later. Um, do we, do, I think we talk about Raven a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like if you have text, uh, Raven is like an algorithm that breaks it up in a really nice way to, to do the deduplication. Next section. Yeah, yeah, that'll be in the next section. section. We promise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions about DAGs and block sizes? Yes. Do, do you believe that the current algorithm is very efficient, or is there still a lot of work that's going on? Which algorithm? The, like the, <laughs> the produ production of the DAG for anything that's put into add, for example. Um, I think that we, we have some good options. So the problem right now is that we, we are not pre-configured for different data types to use different chunkers. You have to tell it which chunker. I think that we have some really good options in which chunkers to use. and pretty decent defaults in the chunker. I think that the, the thing that we're not very efficient at right now in Unix OSD 1 is um, the, the DAG that leads up to the file. So the, the directory in the file, right? So like if you have a really tiny file, we don't have a way to like just inline that binary into the file and then if that file is really tiny, inline it into a directory, right? Like if you had a directory of five files and the entire set was like you know, maybe 
like one tenth of a megabyte, just one block. Like who cares? Um, but we don't actually have a way to do that in DAGPB right now. So um, at, in the initial SV2 deep dive uh, later today, I'll, I'll get into sort of how we might solve some of the problems. So I think that we, we don't have a very efficient way to create <coughs> the DAG leading into a file, but once we get into file chunking, we, we've done some pretty good work there. Are there some plans? Sorry. Uh, are there some plans to have an inference sort of for associating file type or depending yes. on file data? With yes. The yes. But in Unisys v two. Yes. Uh -huh. So a block is like a blob of data, which could be more than one file, one or more files, or is it going to just have be one file? Like if I have a text file. That's mm -hmm. So right. I have like 10 files in my repo. Mm -hmm. That's many blocks right now. Um, so r right now in UCC1, that's going to be one block for the, the, the for sort of file metadata, and then at least one block for the actual file data that, that it's linking to. Um, and then the directory around it would be another block that links to those. So a block wouldn't contain more than one file? So they will in the future. I, I think that like, if you're just thinking about DAG sort of generically, um, the, the way that we've done things sort of in, in throughout the stack is that um, a block can contain an arbitrary number of what we call nodes, right? So a node is like any map or any value within it. We don't have, um, in, in newer codecs like DAG CBOR and DAG JSON, we don't have any sort of limitations on um, yeah, how deep that you can go in that and what types that you can use. So um, in the future, I would say like, yes, one block could contain many files, um, but r right now there are some bigger restrictions on that. Um, yeah, there is, uh, yeah. To answer your question, there, you should not think of a one-to-one -one mapping between a file and a block, or really any data structure and a block. Um, yep. Um, okay, actually, a question. Uh, okay. Unix uh, FSB2, mm -hmm. it's not added, right? No. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a deep dive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's, being developed. It's your break time now. So it's your break time, time now. You should we're bleeding into the next the break. section is like how we get a file into IPFS and what happens to that file and what DAG structure it creates. Yeah. And we'll do some examples. So if you have like um, if there's more questions around that then I yeah. encourage you to yeah. save them until after that session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and sure. go for your break now. Because we've got so if you come back we'll just do five minutes now. Um, if you come back a quarter to two, then we'll start again. Okay. So. Okay, let's get into some deep diving into how importing files works in IPFS. There are fewer people here, but I'm sure they'll shuffle in. All right, uh, let's get started. What actually happens when I use IPFS add? My file here is a tube of bits. <laughs> uh, and what actually happens is that those bits get divided up into chunks. Chunk one, chunk two, and chunk three. Uh, I'll be referring to them later. So just if you see C1, C2, C3, this, these are the bits of the file, the chunks of the file uh, that get chunked up. So these chunks are arranged into a tree structure, uh, which is a DAG. Uh, and so we've already talked about like items in the graph are called nodes. Not every node needs to contain a chunk of the file. Some of these nodes are intermediate nodes. They could contain chunks of files. They don't always. In this example, they don't. Uh, so, yeah, we've we've got uh, we've got the chunks in the these three chunks in the leaves of this uh, DAG that has been created. When building the graph, uh, we already talked a little bit about this, um, but we calculate a CID for every node, uh, and that happens from the bottom up. Uh, and that happens because we can't calculate the CID for the parent uh, until we know the CIDs for the children, because the CID is calculated from the data as well as any links it has. So if the links, if the, we don't have the CIDs for the links, we can't calculate the CID for the, the node. Uh, and so we, we have to start at the bottom here and, and come back up. And at the top, we can't do the top one because we don't have the one below it. So we have to traverse all the way down to the, to the leaf and then slowly make our way back up again. Uh, and we finally get to the root CID, C QM hash six. Uh, and so for a single file, this is the CID that is returned to you. And you can think of this CID uh, as the CID for your file, but actually it's the CID uh, of a node at the top of a tree, which makes up your file. Okay, so 
Let's see it in action. You can try this out in your browsers as well. Uh, DAG.IPFS.IO. Drop a small file, like less than 100K onto it. People people have been dropping like five meg files on it. And uh, the, the, I've set the chunk size pretty slow, uh, pretty low. Um, and like their browsers start like whirring and because it's trying to render a graph. So what it does is it renders the DAG for you. Uh, and it's trying to render a graph of like a million nodes. Uh, so yeah. <coughs> Just drop a small file on it. <laughs> uh, so here we go. If you go too small, then you'll just get a single, <laughs> a single node. So like, there's a sweet spot. All right. So here we go. You should end up. You should see something that looks like this. Uh, let's just move these up a little bit. Oh, hang on. Let's close that. Don't use that anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. Help if I had my. A folder of bits on the desktop, wouldn't it? Right. Okay, so you should see something a little bit like this. Um, do, 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 where's my notes? Okay, so what is this? This is a tool that runs JSIPFS in your browser. If you drop a file onto it, it will um, draw the DAG that gets created. Um, so what we can do is we can drop a file on. <laughs> right, we can drop a file on. This is the README from the Go IPFS uh, repo. Uh, and it will render my DAG for me. And then I can hover over nodes. And I can see that on the bottom here, we've got a bar which tells us information about each node that's been created in the DAG. And, each, and we can see that each node has a different CID and they're, they're put here. Um, they're displayed here, um, and then I can change. I can change things like the chunk size. I can, at the moment, we're we're creating five twelve byte chunks, but I can, I can change that to one o two four, and I get a graph with far fewer nodes because each chunk is able to have much more data in it. I can push that up to get an even smaller <coughs> graph, and go all the way. This is the default chunk size in IPFS. I just get a single node for this small file. There we go. Cool. So back back to the slides. All right. We've talked. We've already talked a little bit about this, but why why vary the chunk size? Um, so the default in IPFS at the moment is whenever you add a file, just to chunk it up in fixed chunk sizes. Um, we have a default for that, and we've just been changing that a little bit. Um, but like smaller chunks, uh, potentially because they've got fewer bytes in them, it, we've got a better chance of deduping them. Um, but it, like uh, like Michael's already said, uh, it's more work up front to create all of those chunks. You have to you have to create hash hash the data, and uh, for, for the CID for every single chunk. And the more chunks you have, that's more work up front. Uh, if we have larger chunk files, then that's less work up front, but uh, easier to, like, there's fewer nodes to traverse when you're transferring the data, fewer nodes to transfer, um, and, uh, yeah, but uh, it's not so necessarily so great at deduping. Um, smart chunk sizes, on the other hand, now that's an interesting one. So, like, maybe you have a chunker that chunks at keyframes so you can have better seeking in videos. How cool would that be? Or it might be a chunker that does like like very uh, like cleverly chunks the file so that um, so that if you add data in the middle, it doesn't throw off all of your. So the problem with like fixed chunk sizes is that if you add a bit of data in the middle, then everything like it throws off the rest of the chunks, and those so those chunks are now different. Uh, and so the deduping is not necessarily as, as good. If you use a smart chunker, which will uh, take that into account, maybe give you a chunk that's a little bit bigger for that data, then you can keep the same chunk, chunks that you had before for the rest of the file. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. So we have a smart chunker already. Uh, it's called Robin. Uh, you can use it in, uh, in JS in the browser. Um, which is brand new, by the way. It's sort of like a little wasm thing, uh, which is super cool. Um, and it's in it's in that DAG uh, that DAG visualizer as well, so you can check that out. Um, uh, so yeah, smart chunk size is really interesting. But again, it's more work up front to do that work of kind of figuring out where is the appropriate bound chunk boundaries. 
So that's always content specific. You have to know what type the data is. Well, so Robin doesn't know. Oh, okay. Uh, Robin just takes a stream of bytes and figures it out. It's very, it's it very clever. It <laughs> okay. It, it is crazy old R sync magic. Mm. Okay. It's been around for a long time. It's not. It's not IPFS specific. Uh, <laughs> Um, cool. But yeah, this, so at the moment we have these two chunkers like fixed and Robin, but that like we could have many different chunkers for in for many different file types um, that would do the right thing uh, based on the file, um, and and you know we could have some really good good deduping, good chunking. Anyway, okay, so back to the example. Let's look at deduping in the visualizer. All right, what I've got here is a, I've copied the readme, and what I've done is I've just added some data to the end of it, so it's a little tiny bit bigger. And what I can do is I can drag and drop that on, on here, uh, and what the visualizer tool does is it adds a, a directory for these two files, so these, these two nodes directly descending from uh, the directory are the two files that I've added, or the, the roots of the two files I've added, basically. Um, and you can see from the lines in this graph, they actually share almost all of the nodes apart from so right at the end here so we can pick these up and drag them we can see that there's two little chunks here and here which are the only two chunks that are not shared by uh, by these files which is kind of cool and you can see that this this chunk uh, if you look at the um, ugh, ow, the byte size here um, it's this chunk has slightly more bytes than than this one and what's happened here is that uh, we haven't, I haven't managed to get it so that it, it, like it's, it's on a complete boundary. So there will be some shared data in these two, in these two chunks, uh, but one of them has that extra bit of data that I've added to the file. Uh, so yeah, this is this is deduping, and this is how the two two very similar files on disk can uh, it don't actually take up two times storage space in IPFS. Right. Okay, so actually, I've not told you the whole truth about this. The nodes in the graph are not just made up of the chunk of the file, the file data. <coughs> Every chunk is wrapped in this thing that we call the UNIXFS wrapper. And UNIXFS wrappers, uh, are, they can either be files, they can be directories, there are other types, but these, these two are the main, main two, and it allows, to, allows us to distinguish between what is file data and what is a directory. Uh, so it's kind of a dream within a dream. Uh, it's, <laughs> not just the it's not just the data, it's a wrapper, and that, is, that is becomes the data. Uh, so what that does is it actually adds like a few bytes of overhead to every node because uh, we've got the UNIXFS wrapper around each, each bit of data. So uh, let's take a quick look at that in, in here. Uh, okay, so we can see in the bottom left-hand corner, if you hover over a node, the, the UNIXFS type that that node has, and this, uh, this one at the top, as I said, they, what, it, the, what the tool does is it puts two files in a directory, so this is a UNIXFS directory, uh, and these other nodes are all kind of UNIXFS file uh, nodes. And so we can see <coughs> the total bytes that make up this node and the bytes of data in this node are slightly different. And that's because there is this UNIXFS wrapper, there's, there's a few bytes of wrapping data uh, that, that is in every single node. What we can do is we can change, uh, we can change uh, the leaves to using raw leaves. And what that does is instead of adding the UNIXFS uh, wrapper to the, to the leaves, it will not do that and just, uh, it will just add a raw buffer of data as the leaf. And you can see that the byte total for these nodes are exactly the same as the bytes of the data. So we don't have this wrapper anymore, and that means that we save a little bit of space on every node we create uh, because we don't, we're not wrapping it with, with any information. It also means that we get a V1 CID. So you can see here, this is, this is a V1 CID. So these ones are like start with QM, that's a V0. These ones start with, well, a BAF K in this, play, in this case. <coughs> Why do they? Why is 
the CID different? Confusing. So the CID is different because. I know where the hash is different, but why is it a different format? CID v zeros, uh, as we talked about earlier, they have implicit uh, things about them. One of those things that is implicit, that is not written, that means it's a v0 CID, is the IPLD format. And the IPLD format for these nodes is uh, DAG PB. For the raw nodes, because so the IPLD format, if you remember, tells us how to decode the data. So we know that, that what this data is, it's, it's, a, it's a protobuf encoded chunk of data, and I decode it. Um, with uh, using, like, you know, like as, it, as if it were a protocol. Yeah, okay. So this, this is just raw bytes. And so this has the IPLD format, IPLD raw. But why wouldn't you just use V1 for the Unix of this as well? For these ones? Uh -huh. <coughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, and the, I think the, the answer is it will be soon. Uh, we're, the, we're kind of in the middle of transitioning. Um, it, at the moment, if you IPFS add things and specify this CID version to one, then you'll get a V1 CID. It's just because this is, this is what people are expecting at the moment, and it's a big breaking change to switch to V1s because the CI, the, suddenly the CIDs you get back are, not, are completely different to, um, to, to ha what you would have got back before. So, um, so like I said, this is, now, this is now a V1 CID because it's using a, a different format and it, we, we literally, it cannot be a V0 CID because it's not a DAG PB um, encoded data. Uh, cool, so that's that. All right. There's also different graph layouts that have different performance characteristics. Balance layout is the default you get when you IPFS add. Um, and it's really simple to build um, and tr really easy to traverse, uh, but it's kind of difficult to edit. If you were to change it in the middle, you'd have to do a lot of rebalancing to, um, uh, to, to kind of balance it out again. Uh, whereas like we've got trickle as well is an option. It's more difficult to build, but um, it's really great for like streaming, for example, because the time to first byte is a lot less. Like you can imagine, like if I, if I have my data in this lead, then to get to start <coughs> streaming, I need to get hold of this node, and then I need to get hold of this node, and I can start streaming. Whereas, like, imagine I've got a big file, like a big movie file, and it's made a big balanced DAG. And if I want to start streaming it, then I'm going to have to get this node, get this node, potentially this node, this node, this node, uh, before I can start streaming. So, time to first byte is going to be um, much better with a kind of trickle style DAG. All right, so let's take a look at the different, the two different types of um, uh, of DAG layout that we have available. All right, so this is the balance layout, and this is what we've been looking at so far. But if we can use this uh, drop down here, and we can switch to a trickle DAG, and you can see that the layout has completely changed. And this is kind of it makes a really interesting structure uh, if you add like a bigger, bigger file on it. Um, oh. But one thing to notice is that this CID up here, if we check it out, it's a QM. It kind of ends with CWESU. If I, if I change the to a balanced DAG, starts with QM, doesn't start, doesn't end with the same same characters. Um, and this is the same data. Like if we've not changed the data, we've, all we've done is change the options here. And actually, if you change any, any of these options, then you'll get a different CID. So there's, there's something to note there, uh, or take, take heed of at least. Uh, you do get different CIDs if you change the different options, um, because the, 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 um, the reason is that the, it may have more or less children and those children will have different will have different CIDs because they have more or less children. So it basically propagates all the way up to the top, um, and you just get a different CID for the same data. Now, 
if you've used the same chunking algorithm, then your leaves will probably still have the same same data that can be deduped. Um, but it will just be the intermediate nodes that have different CI um, different CIDs. So there we go. Uh, there was a question. Yeah, I was. You, you said that there was the same data, but technically all of the blocks include links, which I think you mentioned, which causes the hash to change, and that's the yeah. main reason. Yes. Yeah. Because that, exactly the link structure. Is yeah, the yeah. So the, yeah. Uh, so I say it's the same data, and it's the same file data that was added to the DAG, but the intermediate nodes, um, okay. they are the thing. They are the things that are changed that are causing um, the, the 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 root CID to have changed. Yeah, you're right. So I think on that as well, then. Yeah, if you change if you change the chunker, then yeah, the, the, the it won't it won't necessarily yeah. be deduced <coughs> nearly as well. I guess I'm envisioning something like um, if I have a, a streaming service, the triple dag makes a lot of sense. But if I have an archival service, the you know maybe the, the standard default balance would be better. So it'd actually be two completely different files out there. Yeah. 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 I'd say the thing is this this. This is all available as like options, but you know, ninety nine percent of the time, people will just be IPFS adding, and it will, it should be doing the right thing. And I think we need to get better at uh, actually building an appropriate DAG for the file you've added and for choosing a you know a good chunker uh, because of this. But if I understood it correctly, the actual chunks will stay the same. So you still have a lot of deduping options. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you can imagine but, that. But not if you change the chunk size. Right. Or the but, chunk but if you just change the DAG strategy. Yeah. So you can imagine a service that takes data that was added using a balanced DAG, restructuring it yep. for streaming purposes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That would be fairly cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. All right. Cool. Let's move on a little bit. Okay. The mutable file system. Okay, so it's, uh, we've got, not got a lot of time left, so we're gonna. This is meant to be. Wait, when does this session go on? Till quarter past. I think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, mutable file system. Okay, what is it? Well, let me explain. <laughs> okay, mutable file. Uh, the MFS, the mutable file system, is an abstraction in IPFS that lets you deal. Uh, deal with uh, files in IPFS as if they were a mutable Unix style file system. It takes care of the busy work involved when creating new DAG structures when you change files. So at a high level you can kind of think of it like a tracking layer that maps paths to CIDs and like a regular Unix style file system you work with paths uh, and you have familiar basic commands available to you like move, copy, make dir, you know, that sort of stuff. When you're addressing your cat GIFs using the immutable hash like this, so not MFS, um, you have the whole IPFS network at your disposal. So if it's not found locally, then it will be delivered from another peer on the network, assuming it can be found. <laughs> when you're using an IPFS path like this path to my important business document, um, you're asking just your node for that file. If it can't be found on your node, then it will fail. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's no global root MFS namespace. There's no kind of uh, global Dropbox thing that we're all writing to. Um, so yeah. But what you can do is you can turn that MFS path into a CID. You can use uh, IPFS file stat, uh, and it will give you it will give you more than the CID, but it gives you, so I can stat my business document doc text and I get back a CID QM doc text. Uh, and then we could share that CID with someone and they'd be able to ask, like, ask the, or get that content from the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. But uh, you should be kind of careful when sharing a CID that you've got from your MFS system. Why? Well, okay, let's, let's look into what happens when you edit files in MFS in order to answer that question. Okay, so uh, adding content to a file. Let's say I store all of my notes on frogs in a file in MFS 
at slash notes slash frogs.txt. Okay, so what happens when I want to update my notes uh, with a new, f I've, like, I've seen a new rare frog and I want to add it to the end of the file. <laughs> Uh, like you can imagine the path slash notes slash frogs dot text to be something like this in the DAG. Uh, so a UnixFS directory for slash uh, right at the top, and that is the current MFS root. And IPFS keeps track of this. Everything that hangs off of that MFS root is safe from garbage collection. It won't be collected. So that's that's good at least. So what happens when we want to add some data to that file? We've got a new chunk, QM chunk free, um, and that's, that's got all of my notes on this new frog that I've seen in it. Well, we need a new node. We need an updated node, which points at the previous chunks as well as this new chunk. Uh, so we've got a new, uh, a new node, a new CID for the frogs file that I have. And because we've got a new CID for the frogs file, we get a new CID and a new node for the notes directory because, as I said, the CID for nodes is created from the data as well as the links. Because my link has changed, my directory has changed. And this propagates all the way up to the root. So qm slash dir, we've got a new CID for the MFS root. And IPFS keeps track of that. So it's now, it's new MFS root is this directory. And the, the nodes that I've grayed out here are now eligible for garbage collection. So they may be collected, depending on the settings of your IPFS node, they could be collected, you know, whenever, in an hour, uh, when, when you've added those more content, or never at all, you never know. Uh, but yeah. Okay, so back to sharing content, uh, what have we learned? Well, uh, what happens if you share a CID for a file with someone that you've got from file stat from your MFS thing, and then edit the file? Anyone speculate? Right, it might, it might be gone. So the CID for that file changes, right? Um, the recipient doesn't get informed that it, that's been changed. There's no automated kind of, by the way, the CID has been changed. Like this, like IPFS could never know that because it wouldn't know that you've shared that CID with, with someone else. And it's also not, you know, like the recipient is not guaranteed to be able to access that older content. Like they might be able to, because it might not have been garbage collected yet, but uh, they might not be able to. Yeah, question. Like, would it be useful to have some kind of update message? Yeah, yeah, there, it would. <laughs> but it's, there's nothing kind of that yeah. does that automatic at the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can, yeah, cool, OK. Um, yeah, going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad you're all listening. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, so uh, th this is the difference between kind of names and addresses. And MFS is names for content, um, but it says nothing about the addresses. So content addressing is like has this restraint that content is immutable. Yet we are we have this mutability layer on top of it. And so location addressing is kind of fun because we can change things and still get them at that URL. But there are we've already talked about the problems that are, that are kind of apparent with that. Um, we in IPFS have this thing called IPNS, uh, which, uh, which is a means of addressing mutable content. And so IPNS maps names to addresses, kind of like DNS maps uh, names to IP addresses. Um, but in a P2P system, it requires kind of some kind of quorum over what the latest version of a thing is. So it can sometimes take some time to figure out uh, what that latest version is before you get it. So there are some kind of issues with that. But yeah, I IPNS is, a, is one way in which you can address mutable content. Um, so you'd have to somehow uh, stat the MFS route every time it changes and update your IPNS record to more point to that new, new hash. So, I'm, I'm not going to go any more into IPNS in this, in this session, but um, the rest of the time, which is now like two minutes, could someone get the, pull the door to it? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, We've got not very much time left, but um, I will point you at this new, br this brand new tutorial. We've got this um, this site called Proto.School, which which teaches people about IPFS concepts. We've got a brand new tutorial for MFS that was built for Camp, um, and uh, if you head on over to Proto.School, 
the, on the home page you should see a MFS uh, a link to the MFS tutorial uh, which will cover a bunch of the things that I've just talked about but as well as um, there's coding exercises and, and all sorts that um, that will kind of keep you occupied and help you learn a bit more about